I'm going to share with you today some of the ideas and experiences that shaped my passion and my commitment to ending youth violence by treating violence the way you would treat a disease. Today I challenge you to adopt this idea. We can create change and peace by tapping into empathy and compassion, even, maybe especially even, when we are at our most vulnerable and compromised. The personal things I'm going to share today are merely snapshots of things that I found deeply challenging, but things that ultimately led me to my life calling. I was born without a safe or stable place to live, and from the time I was a little girl, I was aware that violence was a generational legacy in my family. My brilliant and dynamic and extremely complicated parents, whom I love with all of my heart, met in the anti-war movement of the late 1960s, and they bonded through their shared disenfranchisement from society and through their unresolved anger, fear, and pain, which made them vulnerable. Abuse and neglect was a part of our lives. My vulnerability to violence was determined in part by my family and environment, and because my immune system was the thing that keeps us from getting sick, was weakened. I understood that violence was wrong, that hurting people isn't right. But because violence was a part of our lives, and because I was extremely vulnerable, I became infected. And so I did what I think many young people do. I turned it inward, and I hurt me. As I grew into my young adult life, I led myself to danger over and over and over again. I led myself to eating disorders, to drug abuse, to dangerous places, to unsafe people. I perpetrated violence by exploiting the most vulnerable person I knew, me. Then when I was 17 years old, something terrible happened to me that created an opportunity for me to summon the deepest compassion and strength and begin recovering from what I now know is the disease of violence. I was in a foreign country. I was traveling by myself. I was alone. I was lost, and I was violently sexually assaulted by a young man I met who left me at the side of the road with nothing but a towel. Bleeding, clutching this towel, standing by the side of the road, I had a profound realization that has compelled the rest of my life. I realized that what had happened to me had nothing to do with me. I realized that my experience was a symptom of someone else's disease, and I realized that I also had the disease. And in that moment, there wasn't right or wrong or even a person that had hurt me. There was just a sickness and an infection. And crazily enough, my attacker and I, we had that in common. We both suffered some part of the same disease. Later on at a train station, I was trying to get back to safety, and a kind conductor gave me his coat to cover up, and he gave me a seat even though I couldn't pay. And then back in the city, a cab driver approached me. Miss, you look lost. I'll take you anywhere, no cost. This day that was filled with so much fear and hurt was also filled with the empathy and compassion that anyone who was suffering, victim or perpetrator, deserves. These events changed me. They opened my eyes. They opened my heart. If I could find compassion for this person who had hurt me the most, could I find compassion for myself? And more importantly, if I could find empathy and compassion for my attacker, could I teach these feelings to other people? I started my career working with juvenile male sex offenders, and as I think many of us know, juvenile sex offenders are almost always victims of sexual violence before they become perpetrators. I was working in a group home, so we spent a lot of our time trying to relearn normal family life together. I threw them birthday parties. We had Christmas pageants. I was like a weird matriarch of a family of lost boys who had been deeply hurt, but who had committed such acts of hurt and violence against others. And in order to start my own healing, I had to tap into the vulnerability of my girlhood the vulnerability of the violence that was a part of my family, my environment, and the anger and pain that I turned into violence against myself. And I had to see myself and the boys as impacted with the same disease. 
I called upon empathy and compassion daily, and I really believe I was teaching these feelings to the boys. And I was also trying to teach them that they could recover, they could reclaim their lives, they could connect to the things that would keep them ultimately safe and thriving. In 1999, I began running a program for the YMCA of Greater Seattle for youth involved in a different kind of violence, street gangs. In the first few weeks of my job, I went to San Francisco and I attended a training and it finally gave me the language to explain those feelings of compassion, of sameness with someone who's been infected with violence that I had had years prior by the side of the road. Dr. Joseph Marshall, the founder of the Alive and Free movement, was teaching people to really understand the disease of violence. He was teaching us to identify explicit risk factors and to apply a prescription. His method of teaching required that we go deeply into ourselves and discover where and when we had been infected with violence. And what risk factors had we been exposed to and were we still exposed? And most importantly, could we apply this prescription in our own lives? And this blew my mind. This was such a tangible prescription that I could bring back to Seattle to the young people I was working with who I, I really saw being infected with the disease of violence at epidemic rates. My first day back from San Francisco, I taught 12 teenagers in my program everything I learned. And I told them everything. I told them violence is a disease. Carrying a gun is a symptom to the disease of violence. And it can happen to anyone, even me, even the lady teaching their class. I told them that family and environment is the biggest risk factor to the disease of violence and that this was the risk factor that had exposed me. And something really powerful happened that day. They started to develop the capacity for understanding that we are all the same. Me, them, their enemies in the streets, the cops, all of us were the same. So the next day, those 12 teenagers brought 28 new kids. You tell them what you said yesterday. <laughs> I'll never forget this kid named Michael. He demanded that I give them the cure for the fever. <laughs> no offense, but you're white. Do you still fucking get it? <laughs> then he turned to his peers and he said, and you all better shut up and listen because this is the realest shit you're ever going to hear in a classroom. Well, this real shit that Michael was describing, it's really just language that acknowledges the simple fact that being compromised and being vulnerable and being filled with anger, fear, and pain can lead to violence. The prescription that Dr. Marshall teaches involves a complicated process of eliminating your risk factors, dealing with your emotional residue, and then adopting these four new rules for living. And these rules are what changed me, and they are what cha is changing now, I believe, the young people I see recovering here in Seattle and around the world from the disease of violence. They're meant to anchor us when we are at our most compromised and vulnerable. These are the rules I was trying to live up to by the side of the road, and 25 years later, I'm still working every single day to master. The first rule, respect comes from within. Respect, the concept over which so much violence occurs, is not something that anyone can give or take away from you. The word respect comes from the Latin respectus, which means to look back upon. So this definition teaches us that respect is a reflection, a mirror image. And just like the image in a mirror, it can't be given or taken away. Self-respect is the best safety barrier, and it has to be practiced and developed how other people treat you is a reflection of their own self-respect. The second rule, change begins with the individual. No one is responsible for making you change, and you can't make anybody else change. Self-motivated change is the only change that lasts. The third rule, a true friend will never lead you to danger. Value Above all, the people in your life who have your well-being in mind. We owe it to ourselves and to each other to develop relationships that are respectful and honest and safe. And most importantly, these are the relationships I think we have to have with ourselves. And the final rule, there is nothing more valuable than an individual life. 
all life is valuable. All life is irreplaceable. Respect and value everyone's right to their life and freedom and respect and value your own. Since the day I came back from San Francisco, I have worked to develop a practice and a curriculum that has allowed over 8,500 young people in our YMCA program to learn the Alive and Free prescription. And that activity, I'm uh, sorry, the uh, roadside, <laughs> where I stood vulnerable in a towel, is now represented in an activity we call the Road to Alive and Free, where we ask our young people to take a searing moral inventory of all of the things that have led them to violence and led them to their most vulnerable and compromised place. We all have a choice to make. Maybe you all haven't had my experience, but we've all been there. We've all been in a place where we are compromised, where we are vulnerable, and where we are all in need of terrific compassion. We have a choice to be angry or hurt or afraid, or we have a choice to live up to the promise of the new rules for living. So for any of you who aren't sure that you have been exposed to the disease of violence, just know this, by virtue of the culture we live in, we have all had some exposure. Some of you have really strong immune systems, but we've all been exposed. And consider this, these aren't called the rules for overcoming violence, they're called the new rules for living. And I believe that if we work each day to live up to these rules, if we look at everyone with empathy for their humanity, especially but not exclusively those of us who have been infected with the disease of violence, then we can live a life of compassion that is the ultimate immunity to the disease of violence. And we can find a place where we discover love for our own vulnerable and precious selves and for each other. I really believe that empathy and compassion have the power to change the world. Thank you.